quite pleased to authorise it to uh, get rid of cameras if you need to. A bit, like, a bit like Garza here. Yeah, very funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, back to you. Okay, now let's give uh, another another diversionary tactic. Another one. Okay, um, I'm afraid it doesn't change the fact. That what people don't, our friends here don't seem to understand. It doesn't change the facts. However much you divert uh, people's attentions, whatever fuss you make, doesn't change the reality. So the reality is that uh, the way Israel does it, as I was saying, is that on the face of it, you cannot point to any law, most laws rather, and say, ah, but in law it says an Arab and a non-Arab. But if you look closely, you will see that that is actually not true either. First of all, I will just want to make a few examples and then I will end this. First of all, the very definition of Israel as a Jewish state and a state for all the Jews of the world is a racist definition. As simple as that. A state is a usually, as, as we understand it, a state made up of its citizens. It is not a state which is for a particular, particular group of humanity. Israel is a Jewish state by its, const by its uh, uh, founding document, because it doesn't have a constitution, by its founding document, and not only that, it's a state of all the Jews of the world. Imagine this idea. Not the people inside it, not the people inside, the people, all the, all the Jews of the world. So that's the first thing one has to consider. What kind of a definition is this of a state? Secondly, the law of return, the law of return, which has already been mentioned, is a very good example of precisely this kind of thinking, this discriminatory thinking. The law of return says that any Jew residing anywhere has the right to immigrate to Israel and on arriving will attain Israeli citizenship. However, at the same time, that right is not extended to the inhabitants of that land who were expelled by the creation of the State of Israel. Now, why is that? You must ask, what's wrong with the people, the inhabitants, coming to their previous land where they lived, which was their home? What's wrong with it? What is wrong with it? It's underpinned by international law. It's, there are UN resolutions about it. It's a natural right. Why does Israel object? Well, it's obvious. It objects because it is a Jewish state, i.e. it has to have a Jewish majority. Think about that. How can you imagine a state which stipulates that the majority of its inhabitants must be a uh, 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 Muslim, or Buddhist, or cucumbers, or whatever it is, <laughs> but, but, and, 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 and every effort is made to keep it like that. Of, quite clearly, therefore, you cannot let the inhabitants back. So that's the law of return. Now, who is a Jew? Who is a Jew? Now, here's a big problem. Because when the founding of people of Israel laid out this vision of a state of the Jews, who are the Jews? What is the definition of a Jew? Is it a, somebody who practices the Jewish religion? What is it? Now, they have ne they've never been able to find an agreed position. They, at one time, at the beginning, they talked about a person born of a Jewish mother or, uh, and or a person who had been converted according to an orth orthodox uh, system. That's it. Nobody else. Over time, when they saw that they were drying up the number of them, where are they going to get the people? they started to make it much more elastic. So now, anybody who has a Jewish parent or a Jewish grandparent is, is now Jewish. Not only that, amongst the million immigrants it's not right. from Soviet, right. from Soviet okay, Russia... Okay, you have the opportunity to correct me during the question the, time, or I'll make sure that. The, among the, the million um, immigrants from Russia, how many of you know that 40% of these people are not Jewish? They are not Jews. They go to Greek and Russian Orthodox churches in Israel, okay? 40%. Not only that, but when they brought in the Ethiopian <coughs> Jews, they brought, they brought, in, they brought in the Ethiopian Jews, they even fishing for Jews in Peru, they've gone to India, anything. <coughs> you know what the main purpose of it is? 
it's that they should be non-Arab. Non-Arab. You can be, therefore, any sort of person. You can call yourself a Jew. As long as you're not an Arab, it's all right. And so, uh, I, just two more points. Uh, the, um, the question of uh, uh, the absentees. Now, if there is one system which should tell you everything there is that you need to know about the nature of the state, it's the question of the present absentees. Are people familiar with this term? Yes, but it's it's quite not extraordinary. Like the, the, uh, and I'm about to tell you what it is, and you obviously don't know. I do know. The it. present absentees <laughs> are Palestinians, Palestinians, who, at the time of the establishment of the State of Israel, were not in their normal place of residence. <coughs> now, they could have been people who had gone and left, fled because of the war, or they could be people who were not in their particular villages when the war happened, had to fled to relatives, let's say, nearby. These people were pronounced by the Israeli government as, quote, absentees. And it enabled the government to take their land and property. There is one quarter of a million such Palestinian absentees in Israel today. These are people who cannot get their land or their property back from the Israeli government because they are absentees. Um, and um, uh, I want to end on the most important and significant aspect of apartheid in Israel, which should make it very clear to any doubters that this is an apartheid system, and that is the land question. I think people may know, many people may, many people may not, that in Israel, 93% of the land is held by the Jewish National Fund for Jews. It can never be sold or leased to non-Jews. As a result, the citizens of Israel who are Arabs cannot buy land in 93% of the country because they are not Jews. Now, if that isn't uh, discrimination or apartheid, I really don't know what is. Uh, Jenny Tong mentioned the question of marriage. Uh, you know that if an Arab citizen of Israel marries a person who is not uh, uh, Israeli, but the whole point is the person is an, is an Arab, they are not allowed to live with their spouses. They should leave, they either can leave Israel or they can stay, but they cannot live with their spouses. I don't know what you call that. And finally, of course, <coughs> there is the Nakba law. That is the law that is being, being passed in the Israeli Knesset, which uh, says that uh, the Palestinian and Arab citizens of Israel cannot commemorate the Nakba, that is the 1948 dispossession. They have to only celebrate Israeli independence. So, uh, if anybody is in any doubt, as, as, as Jenny uh, suggested, take a plane, uh, don't even go to the West Bank, just go to Israel, and just talk to people. You will see the amount of discrimination that the Arab citizens of Israel endure. Not just them, but the Oriental Jews, and not just them, but the Ethiopians. Do you know that if an Ethiopian gives blood to the Israeli blood bank, People have objected because they don't want transfusion from an Ethiopian. Uh, they do not want to use that. So, in summary, uh, I think uh, it, it really the issue that, that we need to talk about is not is Israel an apartheid state. It quite evidently is. It is a form of apartheid. It's not like South Africa, identically. No, it's not. But it doesn't have to be. You can be an apartheid state without being a replica of South Africa. That's the point. Such an apartheid state <coughs> must not be, does not deserve to be supported or to have apologists for it or to have people defend it. And I know that quite a few of my Jewish friends and people I've, I've, I've come across over the years, I live in Golders Green, by the way, what more do you want? <laughs> um, many of my Jewish friends uh, have felt the need to defend Israel yeah. blindly. They really are so hysterical. They can't pause for a moment to think, is it true? Because such is their psychological dependence on the idea of Israel 
that they feel personally threatened. We have examples of that too. for uh, questions. We started with Jenny who spoke about um, uh, how it's not anti-Semitic um, to uh, be anti-Israeli state. I think that's quite uh, quite poignant for, um, uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion. Um, gave us a first-hand account of uh, what life was like both in the West Bank and Gaza and ended up with speaking about discrimination of the highest order. Um, then heard from Ken talk about treacherous governments, the importance of trade rather than handouts and described Israel as um, as, my, as a microcosm of the world. Um, Dr. Gatha Kami, we heard from just now, and she spoke about the dehumanization of Palestinians and the people of Gaza in particular. She described the way how the way Palestinians are treated would be considered wholly unacceptable if it wasn't for this dehumanization, and gave us a great view of real life in Israel, the occupied territories, and in particular for Arab citizens of Israel, and also to some extent for Ethiopian Jews. So thank you for, um, uh, uh, for those uh, discussions. We're now going, to, now going to open it up to the floor. We're going to do so in quite a structured way, simply because of the kind of behaviour we've had so far. In my mind, I'm going to divide the room into four, and I'm going to take two questions from each quarter, and then I'm going to come to our panel to ask them. Because this, pan this part of the um, uh, room is quite so keen, I'm going to start with a different one. Um, <laughs> So, can we have hands up in this quarter, the rear, my right, towards the rear. Um, I see two hands. Gentlemen in the... Can you wave if, you're, uh, if you've got your hand up? There's two gentlemen there with, with their hand up. I'm going to take um, from both of those. Gentlemen in the jacket towards the front and then the, another guy in the jacket behind. Hi. Um, my question is, uh, 70 years ago, uh, before the uh, Israelis uh, or the Belford uh, promise, as uh, it was exposed, uh, the Palestinians and the Jews were brothers because basically the, uh, one of the facts that were, were not mentioned that you cannot be anti-Semitic if Abraham himself is the father of your or the grandfather of our Prophet Muhammad. So we can't be anti-Semitic for saying the truth, but obviously the media, when it's trying to force all those uh, ig uh, ignorant ideas for people, uh, to trying to show the wrong facts uh, and put a facade and a face uh, behind the truth of, uh, for Muslims, uh, for instance. Before the 70 years ago, how did the pa Palestinians and the Jewish people live? We see in Saudi Arabia, we see the immigrants who came after the 60s when the war happened. They used to tell us that we used to marry from Jewish and uh, people and we were like brothers and we, we, we used to leave our, the, our babies with the Jewish families and we were like brothers. How come after the invasion or after the, the war that happened in, six, in the 60s, it's totally different. It's, not, it's the, op the complete opposite situation after the Belford promise, which is really neglected, but it's really uh, obvious and ex exposed all over the world. If you look it up, you'll, know, you'll see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to take another contribution and then come back to the panel. Now, another one from the same quarter of the room. This so it's easier in my mind. Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to ask the panelists a question I've been um, perplexed about long, many years. I'm an immigrant from Iraq, and I'm now a British citizen. My children were born here and they're automatically British citizens. And yet the Palestinian Arabs living in uh, camps in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and so on, third generation, fourth generation, still they're not allowed to have citizenship in 